Okay, so um, the title of the talk, as the slide said, is Teaching by Example, Worked Examples in the Documentation of Complex Systems. Um, I'm Caroline Loveridge from Thermo Fisher Scientific. If you've not heard of Thermo Fisher Scientific, it's a multi-billion dollar um, scientific service company. So we provide everything in a laboratory that you see from the pipettes and the disposable gloves the reagents right through to the million dollar instruments that you see on CSI and robots for taking your samples, mm. uh, pathology equipment, all kinds of amazing stuff. I work for the software division. So what this talk covers is um, how to use worked examples to give people a much better understanding of how a really complicated software system works and how they can make it work for them. Um, and how we actually go about developing the scenarios for our worked examples and then turning those into a fully fleshed out piece of documentation. And finally, it just touches on the fringe benefits that we found when we started putting worked examples into the documentation because we really didn't anticipate some of the benefits to us as a team over and above the benefits that they've been for um, the end users. So why do we use worked examples? Um, the main reason is just the sheer complexity of the software. So the software I work on is called Sample Manager and it's a laboratory information management system. It's probably about the most widely deployed laboratory information management system in the world. Um, it's designed to meet the exact needs of whatever laboratory it's installed in and it's installed in a huge variety of different kinds of laboratories. We have customers in pharmaceuticals, food, water treatment companies, oil and gas, big chemical plants, pretty much anything you can think of that has a laboratory we will sell the software to with the exception of hospitals and other clinical settings because we don't have the necessary um, features in there for patient confidentiality. It doesn't do medical confidentiality stuff. Um, because of that need for customization, <coughs> it's got an enormous number of many options. I, I did do a quick select on the table. It's got more than 1,500 menu options available in the default system as deployed out of the box. Obviously, one of the first things you do when you customise the system is remove <laughs> most of the menu <laughs> options from most of the user's um, actual interfaces that the, that the users see when they log in. It's got about 300 different configuration settings, so built-in settings that can be used to change the, the default out-of-the-box behaviour of the software. And then in addition to that, it's got two programming languages, one quite elderly built in one that's been running for about 20, 25 years, I think. And nowadays we support customization of the software via an API and C Sharp. So our problem that was what we found was that the bigger the software got and the more complicated it got, the harder it became for our customers to understand how to implement those new features. And what we couldn't do was move away from the old-fashioned basic documentation where you document every single field and every single table and every single window because some of our customers are highly regulated People like um, customers like the pharmaceutical industry, they have regulatory requirements, their software gets audited, their, their implementation is audited by people like the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. So they have an absolute need to be able to present an auditor <coughs> with huge amounts of validation information about their software system. And part of that is do you get comprehensive documentation? from the supplier of your software. 
So even though our documentation had flaws in terms of being able to convey that overarching view of how the software fitted together, we couldn't abandon what we were already doing. We couldn't just simply say, we'll move away from that old fashioned field by field by field approach and try and do something revolutionary with video or similar. It, it was never going to fly. So <coughs> when we did the, when we introduced the API, the C Sharp API, that was kind of a new thing for us. And so the first thing we did was we went and researched what do people think great API documentation has? What do we need to do in order to produce acceptable API documentation? And the thing that kept coming up again and again and again was we want examples. Developers said they wanted examples. They didn't just want hello world. They wanted more. They wanted documentation that explained what the features could do for them why they might want to use particular features, how they could put those features together. And so we thought, right, great, we'll take that and we'll run with it in the context of Sample Manager. So what we developed was the concept of our worked examples and the worked examples show how you can use our software to solve a specific, though simplified, problem that is based on a real-world problem that the user base is going to be familiar with. So we did have, used to have tasks in our documentation, the kind of task that said, here's how you create a hazard, or here's how you create an analysis, or here's how you log in a sample. But they were very, very generic. Because the software is very flexible, there would always be the point where it would break down into, and then fill in the information that you get prompted for, which someone else will have set up at some earlier stage. Or <coughs> if you want the system to do this, then go here. And if you want the system to do that, then go there. And it made it incredibly hard to write a procedure that was comprehensible. It, it turned into something a bit like the choose your own adventure <laughs> example on the left. Um, and so what we wanted for the worked examples was to settle on something that was much, much more specific. You know, the worked example on the right, it, it doesn't tell you how to generically navigate your way around the dungeon. It tells you exactly how to go and find the magic sword that's lying on the floor, but it does give you tips about how you navigate around the dungeon. It gives you best practices about marking your arrows on the wall so you can find your way back to where you went. So it will give you a whole lot of useful tips as to how you might approach your next quest in that dungeon. So that's effectively the, the difference between our old style task-based stuff and the worked examples. The worked examples, there's no ifs there's no enter whatever data you get prompted for. We tell them exactly what to put in every single field. They get the information. It, it, it walks all the way through a very specific scenario with no ambiguities, but it does give you a much better conceptual overview of the system. And so, that was what we found, that the advantage of the worked examples is that they show you how you can glue different bits of the system together to actually perform a big task. It's the difference between seeing a huge heap of Lego bricks in front of you and seeing the instructions that tell you how to build something. Once you've built two or three Lego sets, then you start to know how to stick the bricks together in such a way that whatever you build in the future without your own imagination is likely to be structurally sound. Certainly that's how it works for my kids anyway. Um, and so with the examples, people can take bits of them and adapt them to their own purposes. As long as the examples break down sufficiently granularly so that they're 
there are small steps that you can take and repurpose for whatever you have in mind, then they are useful to help people build their own solutions. And they also encourage people to explore new areas of the system that they might not be familiar with. Because Sample Manager is a very expensive piece of software, I mean, it, it costs many thousands per license, mm. and, and people buy a lot of licenses, and they, it's, it's a very expensive system to buy and then to implement. And that means that in some cases, once a customer has installed the system, particularly if they're in a highly regulated environment, there's a barrier to them then upgrading, even though they get the upgrades as part of their, their ongoing support. There's a barrier for them taking the software and implementing new features because that means there's a big, expensive implementation and validation project. And so the worked examples give people an introduction to a new feature and they hopefully give an idea of whether it's something that they might actually get sufficient advantage from that it would be worth them putting that effort in. So this section of the talk is more about how you go about implementing works examples or how we go about implementing works examples. And so the absolute essential before you even try is you have to have a working system that is under your control. So trying to piggyback on the developer's build machine <laughs> that they blow away all the, every night with their fresh build and all of the data that you were three quarters of the way through setting up <laughs> the day before has mysteriously vanished. That's not the path to a happy life. <laughs> um, I normally use VMs or, you know, if, they, if you can get a friendly developer to set up a, a more stable system somewhere that they only kill once every month or something like that. That's a, that's a better approach. Um, you have to understand the actual audience who are going to be using this stuff. So you've got to understand, in our case, it means having at least some understanding of general principles of, of the kind of science that people might want to do in our target laboratories um, and an understanding of how to Google for some plausible information to, to put in the examples. And then you have to do a certain amount of playing around with the feature as well so that you've got the tools at your disposal to understand its capabilities. There's no, there's no point in starting and just inventing a marvellous example and then finding out that actually the thing the developers have created doesn't have three quarters of the capabilities that you would need to actually implement the example. That's not really a path to a happy life for anybody. So when you actually try and develop the scenario, it, it needs to be based on a real world problem that the majority of your readers or viewers, however you're delivering the documentation, are going to actually be able to grasp. So in our case, we tend to fall back on things like forensic science, because people have all seen TV detective shows, um, environmental science, because everyone understands about you know pollution from factories and things like that. Um, food safety is another good one. I did have a, a nice worked example that fell right out of the horse meat scandal. You know, do you want to send away your sample for DNA testing? It's very expensive, you know. <laughs> um, so that kind of lowest common denominator really helps because if you try if you pitch your works example so that it's aimed squarely at a particularly specialist mm. sector unless your entire software market base is aimed at that specialist sector people are much less likely once they've actually had a quick look at the scenario to pursue the worked example further, even though they might have learned something useful. 
um, your example needs to demonstrate it's got to demonstrate at least one aspect of the feature it's kind of nice if you can bring in several um, so that you, you get more bang for your buck as it were um, on agile projects we are kind of agile mostly sort of kind of agile with certain modifications for supporting our very regulated customers then your user stories are quite often a good starting point trying to take the user story and then build a more fleshed out narrative around that to, to produce your actual problem that you're going to address so when you develop the scenario it's a bit like writing a, a, a very small piece of fiction in order to make the example work nicely and, and make it pleasant to read or to watch you should always give users if users are mentioned in it make sure they've got names proper real person names if necessary give them things like job titles and so on um, give things proper names so you know make it the gas chromatograph in the quality assurance laboratory or production line five or <coughs> outfall into the local river that kind of thing don't just have very generic stuff it, it's easier for someone to remember as they work through the example and the final one which is quite important is to try and use plausible values if you've got data in your example try and make sure that the values that you're putting in are reasonably realistic because it, it wrecks your credibility really quickly if we're doing something like the pollution monitoring examples which come up quite a lot because they're quite nice and easy to construct it's kind of important to actually look up what is a plausible value for this particular contaminant in the environment it's no good if you claim that your factory is pumping out say arsenic or mercury at a level which would have killed every living thing for a five mile radius because any of your audience who actually know anything about the subject you've just wrecked your credibility um, the next thing you have to think about when you're doing the examples is setting some limitations on them the software that I work on it is designed to actually cater to the entire working processes of a laboratory and because the whole thing is ultimately one integrated system effectively if you started developing a worked example and took it too far the logical endpoint is that you've spent six months implementing a fictional <laughs> laboratory <laughs> which at some point your, your employer is going to run out of patience with. So you do have to work out where you're going to cut off the example, where the edges are, um, which partly is a function of what you're actually seeking to demonstrate. Most examples focus on a particular couple of areas. Um, so quite common things that we have they'll not have any error handling they expect the person who is working with the final functionality that you've implemented to be following the script and not trying to deviate not saying oops i spilled something or entering the wrong result or trying to cheat and skip a step um, if you've got records that get called up but the only purpose of them is that hey yes we've now successfully attached this type of record to our data say a customer name or something like that then you would just create a record that has a customer name but no actual real data hanging off it if it's not needed there's no point um, and then finally the user interface unless the user interface is actually the point of the worked example then normally the actual end look and feel is kind of basic and 
not the sort of thing that you would perhaps want to deliver in a professionally implemented system, but enough to get the job done. Um, if, if a pleasing user interface isn't the focus, don't worry about it. But often, when you do a worked example, it suggests further worked examples that you could use to extend. So you could then create further examples which said, and now we're going to add error handling to catch out technicians who are trying to falsify their data, or now we're going to make the user interface look exquisite, or whatever happens to float your boat. So once you've actually developed your scenario, so the target that you're aiming at, the next thing is to actually try and build it in your lovely system that's under your control that nobody else is going to interfere with, honest. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is quite an iterative process, especially if it's agile software and it's still maybe not quite as finished as you'd like it to be when you're starting. Um, and in the process, you're likely to run into things where you maybe work out the best way to do things, useful hints and tips that you can stick in your example and perhaps in the wider documentation. You might find that as you go along, ideas occur to you and you think, oh, well, actually, if my scenario just extended a little bit further that way, it would look really cool. And so you refine the scenario. Quite often, you do actually find bugs that you can report to the development team who hopefully are pleased about that. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes, as you're working through, it, because you're trying to do something that is at least a simplified version of a real-world scenario, sometimes you do find those, those nice-to-have little things that perhaps maybe are something that can be snuck into this project, or at least are feature requests that can be queued up for a hopefully near future development cycle. So once you've actually got that works example working in your system under your control, then it's a really good idea, if at all possible, to snag some attention from your team and try and get some feedback on it before you actually spend however much time it takes you to produce the fully fleshed out documentation, it does help if you get feedback so that people can say, yes, that's fantastic, or no, <laughs> why? <laughs> I haven't had that many times when, when someone said, no, why on earth are you pursuing that one? But I do still slightly regret the one that I had about art fraud, which I thought was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Our salesman was a Philistine, um, <laughs> and he's retired now, so I can say that. So you can bring it back. <laughs> um, so, so again, with Agile, we maybe try and talk to people like the development team, the product owner, that kind of people, um, plus anyone else who looks interested, doesn't run away fast enough, and isn't about to run off and try and sell it. <laughs> prematurely, which might get you in trouble. Um, so once you're satisfied that you've got a solid worked example, then the next thing to do is to make sure that you can recreate it in, a, in all its glorious detail and document it as you go along. Um, in our case, we do our documentation just in the, the old-fashioned form of text with screenshots. So very often numbered lists with many, many, many steps. I mean, these things can get really long, sort of. Some of the, some of the ones that really don't have a logical breakpoint where it's, it's something like build up a long graphical workflow, it, they probably go to about 60 or 70 steps. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, that is probably the most maintainable approach for our software. We've had quite a few um, projects in recent years where tweaks have been made to the UI, which are quite significant um, as, as we've made efforts to modernise the user interface. Mm -hmm. And so documenting it with things like video, 
would have been a bit disastrous <laughs> as we'd have then had to go back and re-implement all of the video, you know, retake all of the videos mm. for all of the worked examples and nearly every release. It, it wouldn't have been maintainable. So the, the structure of the documentation that we use for the worked example is normally pretty predictable. So we'll have an opening section that describes <coughs> the scenario it acts kind of like the blurb that you'd have on a paperback book. It, it's a, an opening section that just gives people an idea of whether they're interested in pursuing this further, whether they want to actually explore deeper into the example itself. The next section normally describes the actual end result. So what they will get if they implement this example in a, in a system that they happen to have knocking around most of our customers would have things like development systems or sandbox systems where they can play around with stuff. And then again, a description of the limitations of the scenario just to make it clear to people that they can't actually produce something in a couple of hours that they can then use to run their chemical plant because that could potentially be messy. <laughs> so when we're, when we're documenting the system, we try and break it up into logical sub-procedures. Some of the sub-procedures, as I said, they can get very long, but um, it, it helps if we break it down by logical steps, so that if you're implementing one piece of data in one window, then that would be a sub-procedure, and then you'd move on to the next window and the next sub-procedure and so on. Um, and particularly importantly is providing conceptual information that describes why you're doing things, that provides context as to what the purpose is of these settings that you're making as you go along, because that's how people actually learn. Um, I mean, one of the things that we've done is, in some of our UIs, there is room for people to enter comments mm -hmm. against stuff. And so we make extensive use of the comments fields in the worked examples. So we'll, we'll just, each time there's a comment field, we'll tell them to paste in all the conceptual information that explains why they're doing this particular bit, which is, is just a neat way of working it into the, the flow of the example. Don't worry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. It's, it's really not the space after, after a so, while. <laughs> Once you've actually created your example, then the next step is, is to get it reviewed by a subject matter expert who does all the normal reviews for factual mistakes, any best practice that they can come up with, any um, suggested enhancements where they'd really like you to show off the really cool thing that they put, that they put in that you have unaccountably failed to notice. And please, 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 <laughs> they spent all day on that. <laughs> Um, having made all the corrections for that, ideally it's really good if you can then get someone who is not a subject matter expert to actually test it, uh, so to try and work through it, follow the instructions and see how, if they actually achieve the end result that you were anticipating they would. Um, that will give you any mistakes that are in your instructions that perhaps you and the subject matter expert were both blind to. It might give you information about bits that are missing, bits that are confusing. They might have questions that you think are really worth answering in your text. And then once you've actually got that works example, you can very often build on it. So you can either modify the features of the worked example you've got. So in things like API documentation, where we, were, we had a form designer interface where you could build new bits of UI for Sample Manager. And so we had a whole series of worked examples where it was initially, it was just a very simple property sheet. And then you added a selection grid. And then it was, oh, well, the selection grid isn't quite cool enough. Maybe we could add an explorer grid instead and so it would iterate through adding new pages to this this 
initial property sheet, things like that. Um, if you've got a whole series of examples and you keep on covering similar ground as you work through, then it's, it's a quite reasonable thing to fade out the repeated instructions so that you condense those down in the later examples in the series. Um, so the early examples will go into great depth about how you perform a particular task. If you keep on repeating that task as you go through, then by the time you get to worked example number five, you can just say, yeah, you know, add this table to the database. Here's the table. You've done this umpteen times before now. You should know how to actually go about adding your table to the database if we've provided you with the table structure. So, as an example of a worked example, <laughs> this is a um, feature that we were adding to Sample Manager a couple of versions ago now. So, what we were adding was a feature called Workflows, which lets people via a graphical interface design the workflow, so the, the status flow and events and so on that they want data coming through their laboratory to pass through as it works from reception in the laboratory to final completion. And so one of the features that we had was this idea of taking a whole group of samples of a similar nature and blending them to create a composite sample which was then tested to determine what further action was required on the original samples that you started with. That's a, a fairly widely used technique in things like environmental science and disease checking and stuff like that. Um, if you think of things like um, blood samples of, for blood donation and stuff like that. They, you know, they pool blood and, and test the pooled, do, pooled donation to, to determine whether they need to take further action and things like that. So the scenario we developed, we didn't want to, we didn't want to go into things like environmental science because the, the pooled sample testing in environmental science and stuff tends to get a bit complicated. So what we really wanted was a nice, simple test that gives you a yes-no answer, which did very much suggest a testing kit for some kind of biological, because you, nowadays you can buy all sorts of testing kits mm. for various um, pathogens and so on, where you just drop your substance onto the testing kit and you get a positive or a negative result. Brilliant. So the disease we settled on well, after a bit of frantic web searching was a, a nasty Australian cattle disease called enzootic bovine leukosis, um, which is a, a disease that they do test for by testing milk in dairy cattle. And so essentially, if you've got a large dairy herd and you want to know if there's a problem with enzootic bovine leukosis, you combine all the milk from a bunch of cows, you test that combined sample. If you get a negative result, then none of your cows can be, are infected. Brilliant, happy cows, happy farmer. If you get a positive result, then you then have to go back and test all the individual cows' milk to determine which are the unlucky animals. Um, so because of that nice simple Boolean result and because it was, you know, veterinary and easy to understand, that made it a good scenario for our pooled composite sample. So the limitations that we decided on for this worked example, we didn't want people to have to add fields to the database. Um, normally, when you implement almost anything in Sample Manager, you are going to end up customising the database. But, obviously, in 
real customer facilities, amazingly enough, the restriction, you know, there's quite a lot of restrictions on wandering into the database and starting to add <laughs> tables and fields and things like that. And so we didn't want people to fail at the first hurdle to say, I don't actually have a database that I can start adding fields and tables to willy-nilly. So I can't do this example, even though it looks really interesting. So in our case, we just said, OK, for the purposes of this worked example, you're going to take these text fields that are actually used for something completely different, and they are hereby the farm number and the cow number and, <laughs> and so on. Um, our test just has one yes no result because that's all that we needed to make the example work in real life i'm absolutely sure that if you were implementing this system you'd have a whole raft of extra things that you would enter you'd have <coughs> observations and you'd have probably the number of your test kit and all sorts of stuff that you'd have to actually record but we didn't need that it wasn't required to make the example work so we just had a, a boolean and the workflow has absolutely no error checking. If someone decided to naughtily just mark the sample, the, the composite sample as complete without ever having performed the test at all, the whole thing would just probably fall over in a big heap. I haven't tried. But it doesn't need that error testing in order to demonstrate the features that we were trying to implement. So again, to keep everything simple, we just cut that bit out but it's important to mention that we've cut that bit out because otherwise people might not realize they might think they've done a lot more work than they really have so the way the example broke down these are the sections so we had the scenario explanation at the top which pretty much explained what was on that previous slide with the nice picture of the cow. <laughs> um, we then had a end result section that described the screen by screen breakdown of what you'd see if you were actually a technician in a lab running through this fully implemented feature. And then we had each of the sub procedures describing the data that you would need to set up in order to actually implement this feature. Um, so in this case, you had to set up what's mm -hmm. this? So five separate different bits of data in order to actually implement the feature. Um, this worked example probably ran for about 20 or 30 pages of instructions in order to do that. Um, and the kind of things that this example demonstrated, it demonstrated passing data back and forward between the two different workflows, it demonstrated responding to events, um, it demonstrated making decisions, putting an if branch in mm -hmm. to, you know, if my composite sample returns a positive event, do this, if it returns a negative event, do that. Um, and then finally, what we found when we'd actually implemented these worked examples was that they were much, much more popular than we anticipated. So we put these worked examples in to the documentation and we just thought that they would be something that would be kind of popular with the customers and might actually make the documentation a bit more accessible and might stop the eternal nobody reads the documentation anyway jokes <laughs> but what actually happened was once people realized that they existed and, and as we sat there in meetings and said oh actually i've got an example that that had says something about that was that they were really rather popular internally because they look quite nice and quite fleshed out and they're they're easy to grasp they went down very nicely for things like internal presentations. If you had a presentation to sort of senior management or something, then stealing a few of the screenshots from the worked example and maybe the scenario from the worked example so that you had a sort of elevator pitch for this feature kind of was very useful for things like presentations to management, 
uh, user group mm. meetings where you were trying to give the users a preliminary um, introduction to features that they could look forward to mm. seeing in a future version of the software, that kind of thing. The trainers rather like them because we have trainers who develop training courses. Mm. Obviously, you can't actually get people to your company who've paid a lot of money for a training course and then they get to work through the examples and the user manual costs. They'd probably want their money back. <laughs> but what, what it did give the trainers was, again, that starting point so that they had a better understanding of the feature. They weren't just sitting down with the software mm and the old fashioned documentation and trying desperately to figure out what they could write a training course about. Our, our trainers are kind of busy. They, they spend, they seem to write most of the training courses, I think on flights between different training <laughs> venues or something. I don't know how they do it. Um, and, and so that, that helped them work out how they were gonna structure their training courses. Um, they have been used or adapted for sales demos on occasion if we happen to have something that either can be lifted straight into a sales demo, that's obviously the ideal, but quite often, again, it's, it's something where the sales demo guys can look at it and say, well, this isn't the right industry, but it is the right kind of feature, so all I've got to do is sort of file the serial numbers off, mm -hmm. change the vocabulary, <laughs> and then it will look quite slick. Um, marketing, it can be nice if you've got populated, plausible looking screenshots that they can just stick in a brochure. And then it has also helped the support because if they can tell people, go look at step 23 in that worked example in that chapter of the user manual, and you will find any, uh, a demonstrated example of how to use that particular workflow node or um, property, it, it makes their lives a lot easier as well. So, so yes, I mean, it, it, has, it has helped our relationship with other parts of the team because it's made their lives a bit easier sometimes. Um, so that's meant there's a bit more give from the documentation as opposed to just being seen as this big, you know, demanding, nagging bunch <laughs> of people that keep asking awkward questions. So, 